Morning, everybody. I know obviously you can't all respond, but I uh, hope everyone's doing well today. So I just want to have a bit of a chat with you this morning with regards to uh, surveying techniques and customer communication. Uh, obviously, it's uh, something that uh, you guys will probably do in your uh, daily working schedules. I'm sure that obviously there'll be a lot of things in here that I talk about that you'll already do, uh, but hopefully there'll be a couple of little pieces you can take away with you and uh, implement into your daily working routine. Uh, I am a Brummy, so excuse me if my dulcet tones uh, put you to sleep at some point, but uh, I will try and uh, keep the, uh, the tone a little bit up and down. So it's the main techniques of customer communication. So we're basing this on customers contacted you. They want to have a bit of a chat with you about a uh, pest control issue or a pest prevention service that they might need. So the customer in their head is going to be calling you for a reason. They want to know why do I need a pest controller? Why am I at a point where I need to get a pest control service? So what we want to do first of all is establish our customers' needs. We need to find out why that customer is contacting us and why they feel they need a service put in place. And we want to do that by carrying out open, open probing questions. Okay, so the types of questions you want to be asking is really straightforward. Tell, tell me what the problem is. A nice, easy, straightforward question normally gives you a lot of information in the first instance. What evidence have they found indicating a potential pest issue? Uh, this could be that they've seen a rat at the bottom of the garden. They could have found droppings. Could be noises coming from an area of a property. Could be various reasons as to why they believe they have a, pe a potential pest issue. How long has the problem been going on for? Is it a problem that's recently started up? Is it something that they've had to try and deal with previously and unfortunately been unsuccessful? What are their surroundings like? Now, this is a key one because obviously if they've got neighbours who leave rubbish in the garden, if you're a business and you're surrounded by, you know, sort of railway or embankments, if you've got canals or rivers nearby, all these sorts of things will then help you establish the level of problem. What previous pest control have you had on site, if any? If they, they might not have had a pest control right previously, they might have tried to attempt to do it themselves. And what type of building are they in or what type of property? Property. Last thing you want is to be going out to a mouse infestation that's in a terrace property, mid-terrace, you're going out fighting fires and you've got the problem coming from one of the neighbours. It allows you to then do next door calls and establish and obtain more business from that area. And what concerns do you have about a pest issue? I think this isn't necessarily something we always ask. Um, my idea of a pest isn't necessarily yours and the same with your customers. I have spiders in my house. I tend to pick them up and go and move them to areas such as the garage or the cellar where they are going to do more good for me, taking down flies and things like that. So my idea of a pest is not a spider. This might be on the top of your customer's agenda. So it's establishing what your customer's concerns are about having a pest. So this is what, these questions are going to bring you to one of these answers. Okay, so we're going to be looking at things like remove or eliminate the pest issue. It could be to do with preventing damage or down to let, if it's a business legislation or protecting from financial loss or damage to reputation. Uh, it could be just to overcome pest-related distress. It could be an insect or, or, or a particular pest species that isn't really going to cause too many issues, but your customer might find it distressing to have them in their property. So we now know what their expectations are. We can manage their expectations. The last thing you want to be doing is offering your customer a complete eradication of cluster flies when you know, for example, there's a potential this is going to reoccur over a period of time. So why do we survey? So a survey to me is an essential part of uh, treating and dealing with a pest issue. There are obviously a lot of situations that you might find yourself in where you're not going to have to survey. I do appreciate that. If you have a wasp nest call out and you find that the wasp nest, your customer says it's five feet off the ground, there's a small hole, wasps are going in there. Are you going to need to do a full site survey? Probably not. We give you a quote over the phone. But there is an element of a survey that you'll need to do when you go out to do your treatment. And that is site-specific risk assessment. So you need to be carrying out a site-specific risk assessment, whatever you're doing, wherever you're going. And it could be a variety of reasons, access. You know, the last thing you want is you're working at heights and you find you need to you need scaffolding or you need a cherry picker, even a ladder to get into a roof space. The last thing you want to do is turn up to site and find that you've got no access. PPE requirements, building sites, you're going to need to have steel toe cap shoes, hard hat, high vis. You might have to have a, if you do the spray treatment, a half face mask respirator or even a full face mask, depending on the type of treatment that you're doing. So all these things you need to obviously consider. Potential for cross-contamination. 
you know, chucking a one shot into a roof space or going up and using your fogger and you haven't done a site specific risk assessment and establishes an open water tank or even bats, you know, which I'll come into shortly. Open water tank, you go and contaminate the, the, the property's water source by using a chemical in that area. Small children or pets, you know, you go and do Mrs. Smith's house for spray treatment, you haven't established she's got a cat, isn't particularly evident. Cat's out in the back running around, comes back in after you've done a treatment, you haven't allowed for that evacuation time afterwards. So obviously just to establish those sorts of things. Environmental risk assessments as well. Um, again, should be something that are always carried out if you do external treatments. Is there a water course nearby? Is there a pond? Last thing you want to be doing is doing a wasp nest treatment with dust going into a building and the dust ends up in someone's koi pond and killing their prize koi. So you don't want to be doing that. Wildlife, non-target pest species, a massive thing at the moment on everybody's lips. You know, we're trying to sort of protect the environment a lot more um, with the products that we use. Make sure you do a full environmental risk assessment. Um, I, uh, in particular, had a, a site that I surveyed, nice and straightforward, care home, few boxes around the site, was all that was needed. Environmental risk assessment, we were able to establish there were actually owls on site because there were owl pellets. So obviously that's what we'll be using is, is a redemptive site in that area. Bats, as I've mentioned previously, bats on site, Bats have a lot more rights than we do in a lot of cases. And as you guys will know, and girls out there, um, the last thing you want to be doing is doing a treatment in the room space whether you haven't assessed whether there's an issue, whether there's an issue with bats. So you need to establish that uh, whether there's, a, there's that problem of, of, uh, in the area. Um, the weather, if you're doing a uh, an external treatment, you know, it might be something that you obviously you'll do on the day, but if you've got inclement weather or you've got you know high gale force winds. The last thing you want to be doing is a wasp nest treatment going into a building with all your dust blowing all over the place. So these are, these are probably the most important things to carry out when you're doing a survey. Other things for surveys as well, identifying pest species. Customer rings you up, says they've got a noise in the roof space. Does that necessarily mean to say that it's a squirrel or a rat? Probably not. You know, in some cases it could be a bird, depending on where in the country you are, it could even be gliscus. So the last thing you want to be doing is offering the treatment over the phone without actually identifying the pest species that you're dealing with. Sounds, you know, customer rings you up and says they've got sounds in the wall cavity. Does it always necessarily mean to say it's rodents scratching or chewing? I don't know whether you've ever had this, but in some cases it could even be a wasp or a bee's nest. You know, establishing these things again will allow you to identify the treatment if needed. And droppings as well. You and I, you know, trained eyes, we know what we're looking for when we go out to sites in terms of the droppings. Your customer ring you up, they're just to them, they're just dropping. So you need to be on site in order to establish exactly what's happening. Okay, pest activity level, identified by a survey. Is it just a single problem with it, a single issue with a pest? As a rat walked past an open kitchen door and found its way into a building, uh, therefore, you know, you have a potential issue, but it is just with one particular uh, single ingress. Is there an issue with multiple pest species? Just because a customer has found a bed bug, it doesn't mean to say that there isn't more of an issue that's harboring within that, that area of the property. Obviously, a survey will help you to establish and identify the level of activity. Is it more than one pest species? Um, I'm going to make myself, my, my house sound like a real pest ridden infested place, but it, we, you know, we have an issue with very carbon beetles that I have to treat from time to time. Um, and we've just found an issue with case very close mob. So, you know, these two things sometimes can go hand in hand. So it's always good to check more than one pest species. Or is it secondary pest activity? Has the customer recently had an issue with rats? Rats have died within the wall cavities or the roof space. A few weeks later, they've got an issue with flies. They then call another pest controller out to come out with a problem. So is it a secondary pest activity issue? Okay, so now we, we want to identify, obviously, the root to infestation, the cause of the problem. And the, the cause could be many reasons as to why, as we mentioned earlier with terrace properties, you know, it could be that they've got an entry point around the building that you need to do an assessment on. You could have proofing issues, door gaps, small vents, uh, vent covers missing, or they could have small holes or entry points. So it's, it's good to carry out a survey in order to establish the, the point of entry. Have they had any secondhand or, you know, antique furniture passed on to them? Um, you know, Great cause of infestation for textile pests, for example, to, to receive a you know, custom buy something online, has it delivered, no checks have been done on it, and they find they've got an issue potentially with even bed bugs, you know, with coming into the property. And uh, rubbish and debris, 
Have they got a compost heap at the bottom of the garden? Have they got, uh, you know, birds nesting or wasp nesting in the roof space? Wasp nests can cause an issue potentially with textile pests. You could even have bird mites from bird nests. So there's various issues there that you obviously need to be aware of. Okay, and finally, so previous treatment attempts. Um, one of the big ones, DIY, as the customer have been trying to get this problem under control themselves for quite a number of years, or you know, quite a number of weeks or even years. Um, you know, therefore, the problem has increased. Poor contractor service. We'd like to think that we all do a great job, and I'm sure everybody does, but there's you know, potentially someone out there that maybe even doesn't have any qualifications who's attempting to add pest control as a whole thing. So is it a previous poor contractor service that they've had? And I think these two go hand in hand in incorrect identification and incorrect treatments. Customer rings you up or sends you pictures of bites that they've had. Now, with the best will in the world, you can try and identify those bites. And I'm sure that, you know, a lot of the cases, it turns out to be the, the issue that they're having. But in some cases, those bites could be caused by delusional parasitosis. You know, they, they could be issues with themselves. It could be issues with static electrical discharge. You're potentially going to have more of an issue by trying to treat a problem like that that you haven't identified. And remember, you can't spray treat for something that isn't there. You shouldn't be carrying out a spray treatment for fleas if you haven't identified that it is fleas that you're dealing with. And finally, resistance. Have they had previous treatments for rats and mice, things like that? And there's a resistance in the air, you know, bromodiline with rats, you know, have they been using particular products? Has a previous company been out and given up? You know, are you now going into it and you need to obviously change the types of bait that you're using or obviously change your baiting methods or your, uh, your actual methods of control? So these are the, all the things that we need to carry out, the reasons why we carry out a survey to establish these, these particular outcomes. And what I've done here is I've just taken a sample of a few different surveys that you might be faced with on a daily basis. Uh, these things, you know, you might find that you do one type more than the other. Uh, but one of them is just try to sort of give a bit of a variation um, and, and just sort of have a look at what uh, you might be uh, coming up against. So here we've got a property, it might be something that you've seen. First thing you notice it's in a rural location. There's a potential here for several different issues with pests. So it might just not be related to one pest. You've got overhanging trees, depending on the time of the year, whether they've been cut back, you, know, you could be getting an issue with squirrels. If we notice at the back of the property, the, the ground is slightly raised. So therefore, the house is built into the ground at the back of the property. This could be allowing in things like insects or even rats and mice to gain entry into the property itself. Have all the soffits in place? Are there small holes and gaps under the doors or around the building at points? You know, vent damage ventilation systems, you know, placing a small vent cover over them will help alleviate certain problems. And then you've got things like overgrown plants and shrubs. Um, you know, not saying to the customer, get rid of all your plants, but there might be harbourage areas in these in these in this particular area that you need to obviously cut back in order to be able to see and to be able to treat. So there's various things like that. I know bird feeders as well, which I haven't put on here, but bird feeders are absolutely nightmare when you're trying to get a rat problem under control. Obviously, talking to the customer about these things will help you. Uh, so here we've got a, uh, a hotel, um, a floor plan of a hotel, uh, issue with bed bugs. Customer in, the, in room 208 has gone to reception, we reported that there's bed bugs. So the first thing the, the reception will do is move into another room, obviously potentially therefore spreading the problem. So what we want to do, you've been called in to do a survey. Uh, what you always want to do with, with a bed bug infestation is carry out a cross check. So you want to be checking the rooms either side and even in some cases above and below. So you know, it might be room, room 308 and even room 108, which is below it. So always do a cross check in terms of the, uh, the survey that you're carrying out. Check with the storage areas as well, the laundry areas. These could be areas where the, you know, the, the maids have taken the carts into those areas and now there's an infestation there. It allows you to try and establish how far this problem has spread. Remember the maids or the, the customers seeing the infestation, it's at a point now where it's, it's evident. So this problem could have been going on for weeks with people going in and out of that room. And in certain situations as well, remember that bed books will migrate. You know, I, I don't know whether you've ever had customers who try to starve them out. Um, you know, and you explain to that customer they can go into a state of diapause. They don't need to feed for six to 12 months um, in certain situations, and they will migrate to other areas to find food. So it's always, it's always good to, to bear that in mind when you're dealing with your customer. Uh, the last one we've got is a manufacturing site. Um, I'm sure we'd all um, love manufacturing sites to look like this. This is obviously somewhere that's very brand new. Uh, it's probably a pest prevention that they're calling you out for. They've had a previous site where they've had issues. 
and they want to make sure these issues don't, don't occur again. We're going to look at this particular picture in question. Uh, at the very top there, you'll see there might be an issue that you can highlight to them that they could have with birds. So there could be an issue with gulls or pigeons in the area. You've got a lot of canopies, a lot of loading bay doors. Um, you know, they might need to have either spiked or netted. Um, making these recommendations doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get the, 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 uh, the order there and then, but it could be something to highlight to your customers to keep an eye out for future reference. So the loading bay doors, you could have potential fly issues. In a building like this, you're never going to reduce that down to, a, to, you know, to sort of low or, or completely eradicate. But you might be able to get it to a, a level where it's, it's more manageable with things like fly units and uh, certain fly control measures. But just something as, as simple as a strict curtain on the doors. Um, you, know, you, you could place PVC curtains on the doors. It'll help not just with flies down, but it'll also keep the, the issue with potential birds coming into the, uh, into the area. And then loading bay doors as well, small gaps at the bottom of the doors, bumper seal, a nice piece of bumper seal across the doors to make sure that door then reaches the ground and there are no, no available gaps for any rodents passing by. It could be waste, you know, just, just like this picture, there could be a bin area or a waste area. At the moment, it's a brand new site, but in a few weeks time or a few months, that could be overloaded with, with certain materials. It's always good to check these things. A uh, couple, of, couple of little uh, tools that I, I think are great to have. Um, Google Earth, Google Street View. Uh, Google Earth is obviously, you know, if, especially if you're doing some like birds, great, you can take a picture of the building itself. You can then highlight to your customer where you want to implement proofing, um, and then you can put that in your report to present back. Street View, you're going to get a front elevation of a building. Um, which again will allow you to put on there, you know, highlight where you want the spiking to go, as with the previous picture, you know, where you want the, the uh, proofing to be, to be placed. And then it allows you to present that back to the customer a lot better. Obviously, a great mobile, mobile phone. They've all got good cameras now. It's always great to take pictures. Um, torch is probably not the best. Um, so you probably do need a torch to go with them. So coming on to evidence gathering, um, one of the biggest things that I found useful in the past um, was. It's really straightforward, but where possible, take your customer with you. There is nothing better than showing your customer firsthand the issues that they're, that they're experiencing. Try and give them a, a, an eye for the, that you're looking at. You know, don't just sort of write it all down and hope that they're going to imagine it. If you can take them round, you're going to probably get a better, better uh, uptake in terms of the, uh, the, the proposal that you put forward. Always gather different types of evidence. If you can't take them round, you know, here we've got grain weevil in the grain store. You know, if you can get a little Ziploc bag, take a bit of the bit of the product. They're calling you out, and they they've got this problem. They should know they've got this problem, but there might be an instance that you find this problem before they have. But then take that to the customer, show the customer the issue. The things like damaged wiring as well. Sorry, damaged wiring and cables. You know, obviously don't go cut the machinery up, but maybe take a little piece of cable if you can find some of it. That might be worth some insurance. And then take photographic evidence as well. Things like dead rodents, take a picture, not nice, especially if someone's eating their, their lunch, but you know, maybe take a picture of any dead rodents you find on site. If you've got a pigeon job, um, you know, take pictures of the birds, of the fowling, that sort of stuff. Smear marks, do your customer are going to just be smudges up the wall to you? You know what you're looking at, so you can take pictures of those and take them back to the customer, or even bin areas, you know, overloading rubbish um, for your recommendations. And finally, we come on to selling the service to the customer. Present the findings back to the customer. It's not always going to require you to fill out a report or to add pictures into a report and email it over. You know, I, I'm a big believer in always trying to speak to the decision maker. Um, you know, whether that's residential or whether that's commercial, you know, always speak to the person that, that's going to be there to sign that, that particular problem off for you. Establish that if you can at the beginning. If not, you know, have a meeting, to arrange a meeting to go back and sit down with the person that makes the decisions. Where possible, present any photographic evidence, as we've just said. And then offer the customer a full breakdown, a full plan of your service. Don't just sort of say, this is the price and this is what we want to do. We're going to do pest control. It's going to cost this much. Break it all down. Don't be afraid to upsell to the customer, proofing, biocidal treatment. Every road job that you do, offer the customer biocidal treatments. Whatever you want to charge, obviously that's down to you. But you offer that customer biocidal treatment. You're giving them the full plan in order to bring the problem under control and to, to, to alleviate them with any regards to any potential pathogens. Finding a contract as well, proofing, things like that. Add, add all those sorts of things on. Even if you want to put them on as an optional extra, don't simply leave them and hope that the customer will deal with them. It's going to help you to get the problem under control a lot better, and it's going to give your customer full peace of mind. 
And I see any questions. I know it is April the 1st, so please no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, we've had a few mentions of that on whether we're allowed to make uh, references to that or, or, or ask yeah. questions that, you know, uh, challenge you in that way. So uh, <laughs> we'll I knew there was going to be, to be honest with you. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what see what we've got. So we've got four questions in there and I'm just going to have a look at them and they're, they're great ones. So I'll read them out for you. Matt, you hear me OK, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Fab. So from um, Stephen Parker, do all risk assessments for each job need to be written and stored or can they be dynamic? Um, it depends on what type of site you're going to. I mean, ideally, you want to carry out a full risk assessment for every site you're going to. Obviously, residential is going to be different to commercial. A lot of commercial places will require you to have a full written risk assessment, which you need to keep with right in the front of your report book. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would always try and do a risk assessment where possible, yes, and a written one as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is with the, if you've got five employees or over, then you have like legal requirements, don't you, in terms of generic risk assessments and then on-site ones, uh, yeah, as, as and when you need them, like you say, site-specific. That's the important stuff, though, isn't it? Site-specific. That, that's yeah. the real useful ones, isn't Definitely. it? Great. Good stuff. Um, so Martin Belcher, he says, thanks, Matt. All great stuff. Um, and there's a bit of a comment here, which I thought was a good one. Recently, uh, Martin got called to noises in a loft across all hours of the day, and it turned out to be a vent flapping in the wind. Um, so, <laughs> um, that was I thought that was just a great comment to read out because it is you know the is, you yeah. kind of hear things and looking out think what's that what's that and yeah you assume it's an animal running around somewhere but but not so that was great yes. uh, thought I'd share that um, Andy Collier so my company's policy is to not use poisons with regard to rodents they only use spring or break back traps baited with food grade bait etc um, does he still need to do an environmental survey do you think um, if the box, if they're into, obviously they're going to need to be in secure tamper resistant boxes. Um, I would still say you need to carry out an element of environmental risk assessment because if you're in an area where you've got the potential for things like you know, field bowls or any other wildlife that could get into those bait stations, you know, those tamper resistant boxes, ideally you still want to be establishing the kind of risks that, that you know, physical risks to those particular non target species. Absolutely. Yeah, good answer. Um, one here from Dave Barron. So after a thorough inspection, so again, this is a, a, a bit of a scenario for you to, to have a think about. So after a thorough inspection, you find no rat ingress points and realise it may be coming from an adjoining property. How do you deal with a neighbour who doesn't agree and won't let you investigate their property? Yeah, that's a difficult one. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can, you can sort of spout all types of legislations and laws and things like that, but at the end of the day, it is difficult to get to, to get people to adhere to, um, you know, to, to conform with what's required of them. They are they do have a duty of care and responsibility to control pests on their property. Um, it's something that they you, know, you could potentially take to the local council, or you could um, you know, you sort of you know, approach the, the, the neighbour themselves and have a bit of a chat with them. But unfortunately, it is it can be quite difficult to get somebody you know, to force mm. somebody to control a particular problem on their property. Yeah, absolutely. We've all we've all come across those issues, haven't we? Uh, I think, yeah, with the, the legislation mentioned, the Prevention of Damage by Pests Act, I think, isn't it? And they can yeah. get a local authority. I used to work for a local authority and we used to deal with that sometimes. And, and, and from that side, it is always tricky, but it's important that both sides have... Uh, you know um the awareness of of emotions and things like that and um you know you can it can be it can be tricky there's no you know one answer to that is there but that was a, a great a great answer very, very difficult, but especially if you don't get on with the neighbors either <laughs> exactly maybe what about drains you think if um if maybe there's adjoining drains because if they're inside the property then, uh, but they're not outside anywhere, then they're possibly coming from the drains. So I suppose possibly, if they've yeah, got a connected be. drain system, maybe they could look at that. Could be, it could be connected drain. If it's a semi-detached or terrace property, it could be coming through the roof space, through, through mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the gaps between the buildings to allow for ventilation to pass through. So yeah, yeah it, it, is, it is a very, very, it, it's a bit, uh, and I've faced it before where you've got someone who's trying to sort the problem out and then the people next door, you know, they don't want to know, they don't care. Um, and it, it leaves you in a very difficult situation, unfortunately, where you know you've got to sort of um, you know, try, try and do the best you can by proofing and things like that as well. Yeah, right. And then when people come across these problems, they can always get support from you know people like yourselves and other suppliers yeah, and, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great. We love talking about those tricky ones, don't we? <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Okay, so um, we have one here. So pest risk is a variable factor. Do you suggest to carry out an assessment at regular intervals and plan pest mitigation actions? Do, is this we're talking in? I'm assuming we're talking in terms of if you've got a site on contract, you're talking about regular sort of checks. I'm assuming. I, I think so. Yeah, the question is, is it's word site, but yeah, I think it's the case of because sites can be or pests can certainly be a, a variable thing. Um, is it a case we should carry out regular assessments at regular intervals yeah. to plan for this? Well, my personal thought is you should probably carry out a risk assessment if you're dealing with, let's say, you know, a large, a large processing site, manufacturing site. It, even, even if you, you're sort of, you know, you've got the issue under control and you're going out and just sort of do, doing the regular checks, you should still carry out maybe a little risk assessment once every six months in order to establish if there have been any changes in the environment around you, uh, if they've had any new additions to the building, if there's been any further issues as far as proofing. So you might still want to carry out that risk assessment as well in between those um, sort of, you know, any potential issues that, that, that might be on site. Great, fabulous. Um, so Nick Bauer here says, regarding bed bugs, if the cleaning staff live in the hotel room, would you would you want to inspect the rooms for bed bugs? Mm. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Um, if the cleaning staff are on site, they live on site. Um, then, yeah, you know, if, if the cleaning staff are going in and out, and let's say they've got a section of the hotel where the cleaning staff live, um, then, yeah, you, know, you would want to check that potentially if that, if that infestation spread from that room, you would want to check where the cleaning staff are living as well in order to establish whether they've taken anything back with them. It's the same with anything with bedbugs. If you've got a customer, as I say, that moved from one room to another, you've then got the problem that it's not just those adjacent rooms. If they've been moved to another room, you need to identify where they've been moved to and survey that room as well and make sure that if the problem has gone to that room, you then try and trace back to where it's been, where people have really moved around. It's, it can be difficult, but then maybe put bed bug monitoring put it, you know, in place around the whole of the site. It gives you extra um, to the, you know, the extra things that you can put onto your service um, mm -hmm. and it gives your customer a bit more peace of mind as well. Great. Um... Dave Harrison, so there's a couple here. I think uh, let me try and word this properly. So the risk of gnawing and fires. Uh, it's echo time with next door. But sorry, do you know what I want? I'm not sure. So Dave Harrison, sorry, I can't. I can't read your question properly. Um, I'll read it word for word and see if it makes sense to you, Matt. Um, so the risk of gnawing and fires. It's EHO time, there we go, EHO. So the risk of gnawing and fires is EHO time with next door. Right, okay, so Dave's making a comment with regards to um, the, um, uh, yeah, if there's a problem next door um, and getting EHOs. I think it's more environmental action teams, you know, because EHOs or environmental health officers are normally yeah. food related and food business That's related. Okay. Yeah, whereas it would be, um, I think they call them environmental action officers. They do like fly tipping and stuff like that as well as, you know, yeah, rats in places you don't want them. Um, so great, I got there, Dave. Sorry about that. I just uh, my, my eyes were deceiving me. Um, oh yeah, and also Dave's mentioned bed bugs. You know, check things like vacuum cleaners and yeah. you know, because yeah. possibly you know, ask some questions about that. Really good point there. Um, okay, so Nick. Uh, uh, oh no, I've answered that one. Or oh, you have. Sorry, Kevin Harrison. Should risk assessments be carried out annually and dated? when carried out can you give advice on environmental risk assessments also um i think it, i think risk assessments comes down to being sites but in terms of the site itself i think i think it is annually i, I do i can find the information out for you but i'm not 100 percent certain uh, but i think it is annually you should carry out at least one risk assessment per annum on a site that you have on, a, on a, an ongoing contract um, and yes they should always be dated um, and they should always be in the report book so anybody who comes onto site can can access them quite easily great good stuff i can um give uh, some more I do a lot of health and safety stuff with the bpca and uh con contractor schemes and things and yeah with risk assessments the the law the health and safety at work act is that as a minimum you have to um, date them and address them every year once a year but really as and when things change so um, you know again if, if something if you buy something new or I don't know you buy a big batch of new ladders and you've got a working at height risk assessment you should then review it at that point that you purchase those new working at height equipment so yeah it's generally as a minimum it's got to be dated every year I'm always chasing people on that um, but yeah generally as and when it changes so yeah you're absolutely right on that Matt. Great, that's all the questions we uh, got through then, didn't we? Fabulous.
Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Matt. That was uh, that that was great. It was yeah, some great questions and uh, yeah, really useful talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Cheers.